morning, Mountain View. Welcome to our online service. We're so thankful that you've joined us here this morning. I'd like to start by sharing some words with you from Psalm 62 that have been a great comfort to me this week. Starting in verse 5. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Let's sing together. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. Sing it again. You are here. Moving in our midst, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are waymaker, miracle worker. In the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I work. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turn the lights around. I worship you. I worship. Even when I don't see it, you're working. 
bless you, Lord, and we thank you so much. We are all feeling crushed and pressed these days. But your purposes are far greater than our imagination could ever conceive. And we're asking, Lord, that you truly would bring the fruit, the, the fruit of the vine, the, the new wine out of our lives, out of this. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for reminding us who we are in you. Lord, show us time and again in this season who we are in Jesus. Yes, Lord. Just to introduce you to this new song. Some of you will know it, but it's just a, a, a declarative song of this is who we are. I am who you say I am.
together. Father in heaven, we are so privileged to be able to worship. Thank you for the gifts of grace of technologies that we can still connect as your church. Lord, we are blessed. We are blessed that we are alive in you. We are blessed that we are um, safe in you. And Lord, we know that these are troubled days. So, Lord, I pray for our brothers and sisters who are in the midst of severe quarantine in places like Italy and Spain. Lord, would you bless them and lift them up and give them your joy. Lord, we pray that, that while the enemy would want to use this opportunity to bring fear and doubt, we pray, Lord, that your purposes would be achieved in and through this difficult time. Lord, all who are listening, Holy Spirit, come. Show us Christ, his, his preeminent glory, meant to captivate our hearts and imagination, the one who is the true glorious one above all. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth, abideth still. We hold to these things, Lord. We thank you. Unify us, even though we are experiencing disconnection. Unify your church, Lord, in the midst of this. Strengthen us in our innermost being, we pray. In Jesus' holy name, we pray this. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. I was going to say you can have a seat, but you're all seated right now. So thank you for singing with us. Well, church, normally we have our sailor time, and this is a, a time to press pause, at least in the singing portion of things. And, well, we don't have Selah, but guess what? We can still have an opportunity to still pray for one another and that we can still give. So I just encourage you to continue giving strongly. And I know we are all feeling the pinch these days, but... As I've been reminded of late, this is really and truly an opportunity to trust in God with our finances. And we're seeking to continue on with the ministry. Many people have wondered, you know, Pastor Gord, has your, has your workload decreased? And the truth of the matter is it hasn't decreased. In fact, it might have increased a little. And that's the same with all of our staff. Their, their workload has not diminished much at all. In fact, it's, it's gotten more. And so we're really seeking to continue the uh, giving as as you have been doing so please do that and obviously if you're just visiting online there's no uh, don't feel any compulsion to do so that we bless you if you do do that so we want you to uh, just again to encourage you to trust the Lord with our with your finances and you can do that online church center app and there's a few other things available as well and if you feel like you need to use the debit machine we can probably make an arrangement for that. Just contact the main office beforehand. Uh, this is a new song for some of you, but it's actually an old song. It's called Be Still My Soul. My wife and I were talking about how very fitting it is for the season that we're in, and we would invite you to sing with us. Leave to thy God to order. 
Mountain View, welcome. If you have a Bible with you, I invite you to turn to Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 16. And I just want to speak out what many of you are probably already feeling. This doesn't maybe feel right to many of you. And you would prefer the, the feel of the corporate gathering. And I think we all lament that. But this is what I know, is that the Holy Spirit is not quarantined. And he is not isolated and he can work in and through these things because faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So if you have ears to hear this, so I don't know if you're on mute, you just want to hit that button. So the words come through and you can hear me rightly. And once you do that, we're good. You can benefit from this. So that's the good news of, of uh, this season that we find ourselves in. Be encouraged. And I believe this passage is just providential for us today because it touches on the most climactic event in human history. And it was through actually the darkest moment in human history that we find ourselves. So when you look across a span of time, this moment we find ourselves in the scriptures is the darkest moment. And we can now enter into this time and uh, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us through this. It really does surpass all the other moments. So what I want to do is I'm going to just highlight, as I read this to you, I'm going to highlight the details of what I want to expound and then give two reasons why I'm touching on the highlights. And then lastly, how does this impact Mountain View in particular? So if you have your Bible again, if it's open to Mark 15, I'm going to read in starting in verse 16. And as the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him and they led him out to crucify him and they compelled a passerby Simon of Cyrene who is coming in from the country the follower, follower, father of Alexander and Rufus to carry his cross and they brought him to the place called Golgotha which means place of the skull and they offered him wine mixed with myrrh but he did not take it and they crucified him and divided his garments among them casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him, and the inscription of the charge against him read, King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right, one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, 
wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. Come down from that cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. Let me just pray for us. Father, thank you so much for this word. Thank you that it is a living word to us. Lord, let us enter into this narrative. Let us approach Easter with a sense of openness to, to how you want to impact our lives. We thank you so much and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to highlight again, walk through the story and highlight some of the ta details that we have before us. The first thing is that Jesus, if you're familiar with the weeks previous, Jesus is basically being paraded around uh, like a common criminal. So he's, he's brought before Annas, then he's brought before Caiaphas, then he's brought before Pilate, and then Herod, and then back to Pilate again. And all the while, he is, he is being witnessed by the public as well. It says in Isaiah 53, 7, that he was oppressed, and he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So we hear through this passage that Jesus is treated like a common criminal, but you could say that even worse than that, he really was treated like an animal. Because in Mark 10, going back a few chapters, you read that Jesus himself predicted it right down to the details. It says in verse 34 that they will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. You know, people today get put in jail for the mistreatment of animals, and, and Jesus is treated just as badly. You know, in the arena of combat sports like boxing or the MMA, the fighters, they get, they get in, into the battle, and then they come out, and because of the, of the fight, they, they come out with puffiness and swelling, and their, their faces are, have con, you know, contortions happening, and, and people will say, oh, they don't even look like themselves anymore. And we read about in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 14, that his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. And so the idea is that Jesus was beaten so severely, he didn't just not look like himself, he didn't even look human anymore. That was the severity. In the previous passage, we read that he was scourged. Ends of the whips, bone, metal, ripping into the flesh, pulling it off, metal fragments. And so imagine in this particular scene, he's just finished the scourging, and now they have placed a purple robe on him, a garment with those open wounds. You can just imagine the pain that he would have experienced as a result. And never mind that he was also carrying the cross. Carrying the cross was a practice that they did, and it was according to the law and the custom that when you executed someone, you brought them outside of the city, and those condemned to be crucified had to carry their own crosses. And so in this case, Jesus' sheer exhaustion would have made it impossible for him to carry this. And just think about what he endured in the last 15 hours. So in the last 15 hours, he had this tense atmosphere in the upper room. He was betrayed by Judas. The agonies of Gethsemane, the desertion of his disciples, the torture of totally hypocritical trial before the Sanhedrin, the mockery in the palace of Caiaphas, the denial by his most prominent disciple, the trial before an unjust judge, the terrible ordeal I just mentioned of being scourged and the pronunciation of the death sentence put upon him. All of this had come upon Jesus. So again, 
Not only was he dealing with the physical pain, but the emotional and relational pain and the isolation that would have overwhelmed his soul. And in the end, in typical Mark fashion, he just is a punchy one clause. It says, and they crucified him. That's verse 24. It's been said that a person who experienced crucifixion died a thousand deaths. And Jesus chose. He didn't want to numb the pain. He was offered the wine and he said no. He didn't want any kind of inebriation or any way to diminish the suffering. So in the crucifixion, they would have taken large nails that would have penetrated through his feet in a small platform that would have, would have uh, been at an angle so that he wouldn't be able to get any sheer footing on that. And then two nails on either side, on, on either hand. And likely the, the nails would have gone through uh, the wrist because to go through the hand, it wouldn't have, the, the muscle wouldn't have been able to hold his body weight. So likely through the wrist would have penetrating the median nerve, which is here, which would have been excruciating, never mind the swelling and the inflammation around that wound that was causing even more pain. Jesus was experiencing this and then through the feet as well. So imagine the inflammation and and for Jesus to take a breath, he would need to press up onto his feet and his, his quadriceps would have been experiencing incredible cramping because of dehydration, requiring him to go back down again just to relieve that, putting more pressure onto his hands and to his wrists, thereby irritating that inflammation. Jesus was experiencing excruciating pain, unbearable. The severing of tendons throbbing headache, burning thirst. The death of Jesus wasn't by blood loss, but likely by hypovolemic shock, asphyxia, because as he took a breath, he wouldn't have been able to exhale given his posture on the cross or heart failure or a combination of all of that. So why am I, hi why am I highlighting all of these details? I want to just give two reasons why. I'm not just simply doing it for shock value or just to offer you gross imagery. The two reasons why I want to share this with you, number one is to show you that, it is to show you the objective truth about what happened here. See, that's why the, the gospel writer Mark is wanting to bring it back to the Old Testament. He's tying it to the prophecy. And even taking... Simon of Cyrene, why mention this guy? He's a bit player in the story. There would be no reason to other than to, to tell the reader this, is who, this was a real guy. A real guy came alongside of Jesus to help him carry the cross. His name was Simon. He's from Cyrene, and he has two sons. So he has uh, Alexander and Rufus. So why mention this? Because he's trying to highlight, again, this was a real person at a real place. Golgotha, the place of the skull. Just like me, Gord Schutz, on this particular date in March, standing in an empty auditorium at the moment. And we will be putting this on on the, the internet and it'll be, it'll be marked for antiquity. Similarly, the, the gospel writer Mark writes down all of these details for the reader to go, that actually happened, objectively true, and it is, it is historical. And the reason for that, so that when people can trace back, they want to know that this actually happened. You know, when we talk about our day and age and the challenges that we're facing right now, when we think of the isolation and people are wondering, people are fearful, they're not wanting a placebo. They don't want a, well, that's good for you and maybe, I don't know if that's good for me that it's good for you or wishful thinking. They want the conviction that this actually happened in history. But the second thing is to show you what Jesus' suffering is meant to do for you. This is the subjective piece. Just talked about the objective. Now it's a subjective. When we see someone we love suffering, it, it causes a, it kind of gets us in the feels. We, we feel the compassion for that person. 
But if someone suffers for you, so they've, they've sacrificed for you, it, it hits your heart, doesn't it? So the husband who says, you know what, honey, I'm going to put away football so that we can spend some time together. You know, that is a very small sacrifice, and it might cause the other spouse to, uh, to, to feel uh, a sense of worth and a sense of, wow, that, that, that was really meaningful. Thank you for that. But we all know that the degree it touches you depends on the quality and the quantity of the suffering, does it not? So cutting out football for your spouse is different than a surgeon cutting out an organ for your spouse. That's on a whole other level. In one case, you feel good about it. In the other case, you have a real soulmate that you will, you will never forget that gesture of love. What about someone laying down, laying down their lives for you? There's this great story in that classic work from Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. I, I heard this from a pastor, and he was describing this uh, two gentlemen. There was Sidney Carlton, Carton and Charles Darnay, and they both are in love with this young woman. But this young woman decides to marry Charles Darnay. And they get married, they have their children, but it's the French Revolution. So Charles actually gets captured and he's facing execution. So what happens is Sidney, the guy who was turned down, he actually looks a lot like him. He sneaks into the prison and he says, listen, I'm going to step, into, I'm going to step in and I'm going to die for you. Just give me your clothes and I'll step in. I don't have a family. I don't have any kids. Just let me do this for you. Charles Darnay says, no way I'm letting you do this. But before he knows it, um, Sidney pops him and he, and he knocks him out cold, quickly takes the clothes off, puts it on him, and he gets some friends to pull him out of the execution aisle. And as he's waiting to, to face the execution for his friend, there's a seamstress there. She's facing execution too. And she hears that Charles Darnay is there. And so she seeks him out, finds him, starts talking to him. And the gentleman who is taking his place is trying to not to make eye contact. And eventually she catches on and her eyes get wide and she says, are you dying for him? And he said, yes. Yes, for him and for his family and for his wife. And her response is, I don't know who you are, sir, but can I hold your hand? Because I don't know if I can face this alone. But if I can hold the hand of someone so brave and so loving, that would do me a lot of good. And so he says yes. He wasn't even dying for her. But we know that that kind of sacrificing love, entering into that kind of suffering for someone, strengthens people down to the roots. What about Almighty God doing this for you? See, this, when we see people sacrificing for us, it It'll do more than just touch your heart. It will change your life. Holy, eternal God coming down, dying so that you could be made right with him. This is more than just being heart-touching. It's life-altering. You know how this, the hymn goes. He took my sin and my sorrow. He made them his very own. You know, for many people today, it's not even that they're suffering presently with this virus. It's the anticipation of it that's causing a lot of pain and suffering. They call it anxiety. We, we're in the midst of it now. We live in an age of anxiety. But this very graphic scene here, Jesus is facing something torturous and he's dying like that. For us, we are meant to see this very objective historical event See him doing that for you and see him standing in your place because it will alter your life and it will strengthen you in the midst of this very challenging time that we live in. Because the idea is if he did that for me, do I think that he will be with me in the midst of this isolation and threat? The answer is yes. 
You know, for many of us, the thought of having our health stripped away or some of these consumer goods uh, being depleted as we look at these grocery stores that are some places the aisles and the, and the shelves are, are barren. We see, these, we see these things being stripped away from us and it causes us so much anxiety. But here are the essentials. Here are the essentials of our faith. We look to this Jesus who was stripped naked, who had his very dignity taken from him and stripped from him. Naked, alone, and wounded to the point of death. But that's just it, isn't it? When we have in our lives things that are threats, when, when some things that we see are being stripped away from us, we have the one thing that will never be taken away from us. And it's Jesus. The wounded Jesus. Remember, remember how he encountered Thomas. And he said, he said, look, Thomas, touch, hear the wounds. That is Jesus for us. That's Jesus for you. And the idea here is to convey that he is all that we need in this life. We have no certainty about what's going to happen in the future, but we have the essentials. We have Christ. Like the hymn says, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Many of you have probably seen the pictures, the pictures of the virus. This struck me. The word coronavirus, as you know, literally means crown. So the spikes of protein come in and what they do is they, they invade the cell by piercing the flesh of the cell. And they use that molecular machinery to reproduce itself and it just causes all kinds of havoc in the human body. What Jesus did for us is that when he was pierced, when he received that crown of thorns, he began to shed blood that would give us life. It's a new kind of spiritual protein. You know, this is what a protein does. It provides structure, it wards off invaders, and it's a messenger. So we believe that because of what Jesus has done, he provides a new kind of solid structure that is, in, that is indestructible. That is the very kingdom of God. And he said that there are things in your life now that nothing can touch. He is strengthening, strengthening you in your very innermost being. The virus cannot touch that. Also, a defense against invaders. So, Jesus, it says in Colossians 2.15, that he disarmed the rulers and authorities to put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And lastly, even the chemical messenger side of things, the Holy Spirit can lead you and he will speak to you. And God says that we have a legion of angels just upon our command as we begin to pray for protection. You know, God has provided, if you are in Jesus today, he has provided the very things that, that cannot be taken away from you. They are solid. They are there. And that is all that we need in this life. Because of the truth of the matter is, our main problem is not the coronavirus. If you look at the three groups of people who are there, there's the bystanders, robber, the robbers and the, uh, the, the chief uh, priests were there as well. And it talks about how all of them really are representative of our society. You have the cultural elites, you have the average Joes, those bystanders, and you have the, the bottom of the barrel in the robbers. And you know, that's, that's life, that's our culture. And all of them, it says, were, were in some way deriding Jesus. And that word deriding actually means... In Greek, it's blasphemeo, where we get the word blaspheme from. So they weren't just mocking some poor guy, who, religious guy who was dying. They were, they were 
mocking and deriding someone who was sacred, who was holy, the very Son of God. It is not recognizing Jesus as the Son of God. But more than that, this way the kingdom breaks through what would have been unrecognizable to him. This is a whole other way of understanding what power is. Do you remember the two disciples, James and John, back in the earlier chapters? They came up to Jesus and said, Lord, let us sit on your left and right hand, just like the robbers were on the left and right hand of Jesus. And they say, you know, Lord, we like this idea of power. If you could just let us sit in your left and right hand uh, to know your glory, that would be really great, Lord. And what did Jesus say? That's not the way it works. The way to glory is always through the path of suffering. The way in which we know power is that we, 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 we recognize that Jesus himself emptied himself of power so that he could make us sons and daughters, and have the spirit of power at work in our lives. The way to glory is, is through suffering, and the only way that we can truly acknowledge Jesus is king is when we bow down in our hearts before him. Bow, let go of our self-sufficiency, let go of our pride, and embrace humility. We have all been humbled in this season. It has caused me to really reflect on my life. What are the essentials? The old normal way of doing things won't do. Jesus talked about new wine in new wineskins. Do you want to be fruitful in your life? The truth of the matter is the grape needs the squashing before it can produce the wine. And so it is with our lives. We experience these things, but Jesus experienced them ultimately for us. Because the things that really matter can never be stolen from us when we are found in him. So how does this impact Mountain View? We're talking about new wine, new wineskins, another way of doing things. You know, we're going to put up the sermons online and you can watch them. And you're going to benefit from them. But a greater, I want you to think about this. This is a time of discipleship. This is going to be a new avenue of mobilizing and, and being creative. So if we come back to our vision, Radiant Church, what does a radiant person look like? They are people of God's presence. When we spend time with Jesus, it changes us. It changes who we are. When we seek him in prayer and seek him through the word. It says in Exodus 34, when Moses came down the mountain, his face shone with the glory of God. Those who look to them, those who look to him are radiant. Their faces will never be ashamed. But the second thing is that there are people of character. How does your character grow? Well, it's it relates to what I just mentioned, is spending time with God, because the fruit of the Spirit will. Will, will come to bear in your life. In Proverbs 4.18, it says, But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. Let your eyes look directly forward, and your gaze be straight before you. Do not look, swerve to the left and your right, and all your paths will be straight. Turn your foot away from evil. You will grow. You know, these, these times of trial and tribulation are often catalysts for growth for God's people in the kingdom. But the third thing is that we are a people of mission. To be radiant is to be a person of mission, because in Isaiah 61, it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you, and nations will come to your light. And kings to the brightness of your rising. Do you know how amazing this is? Don't hear me minimizing sermons. These moments are important. But with all three of those things, you don't necessarily need a sermon. This is not being sermon-centric. That's not how we build our disciples per se. 
as much as preaching is necessary and valuable in this season do you know that you have what you need you have the wounded christ who will be with you always even to the end of the age and he knows you he knows your pain and i'm just always struck by how the lord is in and through these seasons he is ministering to people and he he heals uh, those things that are hurting us, not just on a physical level, level, but on an emotional level. I talk to people all the time about how the Lord met them and healed them of some past traumas that they've experienced through their memories, that the Lord was there. And the, and the pictures that people often receive are that of, of Jesus himself weeping or receiving the wounds on their behalf. He is for us. And he is with us. You have the wounded Jesus with you. But we also have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is obviously going to streamline. He's going to showcase Jesus. That's his job. He wants to shine that brightly onto your heart so that he is always there. When you believe in Jesus, you receive the Spirit of God as a seal upon your heart, and that can never be taken away from you. You have everything that you need and even in those moments when we're feeling this isolation and that can be very very challenging but even in this course of history we are the first you could say it's the first time in history where we can still have uh, face-to-face conversations digitally even a few years ago, they couldn't do this with SARS and some of these other things that where they were saying for people to isolate, we couldn't do that, now we can. I know it's not meant to replace the face-to-face community of faith that we have every Sunday, but this is what we have. So guess what, church? We're gonna continue on. We are gonna move forward. And we are going to use some of these technologies so that we can still enter into discipleship. We can still pray together. So friends, be encouraged. These are the essentials of life. When all is stripped away, we have everything that we need. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for this time, for your grace and for your love. Lord, we recognize that these are challenging days, but we also know that Aslan is on the move, that Jesus, you are at work, and we trust that even Even in the darkness, the light can shine all the brighter. So Lord, would you encourage your church? Would you make your church more fruitful than it has ever been here at Mountain View? And so we pray this for your name's sake and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me give you a benediction as we uh, conclude our time here. Now may the Lord God himself sanctify you completely and may your whole body, soul, and spirit be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful and he will surely do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all.